Let's pray that God will come down during this last meeting and touch our hearts. I am convinced that God has a special blessing for you tonight. That he wants to anoint your eyes so that you can see the tasks that he has for you to do this year. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity tonight of opening your book. We pray that as we do, that you would speak to our hearts where there is duty that you want us to follow. Make that path plain. Anoint our eyes so that we can see and convict our hearts with what you want us to do. In Christ's name, amen. A number of years ago, I was with the production crew of It Is Written Television, taping a series of television programs on the Waldenses and the Reformation period in Europe. We had been in Rome, and we had taped there. We traveled up to Torino in Italy and taped there. We had been to the Waldense Valleys and lugged our, pro our production equipment with our cameras up and down mountain passes and in some of those Waldense caves and li relived that experience. My heart was thrilled with it. We came to Geneva and we're taping in Geneva. It was late one afternoon. We started taping three or four o'clock in the afternoon and had a few hours to tape. The lines called for me to stand in the doorway of one of these great cathedrals in Geneva and to walk down a few steps and out into the street as I said my lines. Things were not going well for me at all. I would walk down out of the steps of that church and get out halfway into the street and I would miss the lines. I would go back and do it over again. After I had done it about 11 or 12 times and flubbed the lines, I uh, went back to do it again and I just about had it and a horn of a car started peeping and I had to go back and do it over again. Then a dog started barking and I had to do it over again. Then kids got out of school and they walked between me and the camera. And after about the 17th take, the sun was fading in the western sky and I knew that if we did not get those lines very, very quickly, we weren't going to get them at all. We had a plane to catch the next day. The production crew was getting nervous, and I was getting more nervous, and the more nervous I got, the less I was able to say it right. You laugh because you didn't have to say it. <laughs> As I was doing the lines one last time, coming down the steps, I had it right to the last three words, and somebody began to yell. They began to yell at English, and I looked up, and they were in the bell tower of the church. Now, not only were they yelling at me, but they were yelling in English, and what they were yelling is even more surprising. They were yelling, American, American, we hear you are speaking English. We are tourists. They lock the church at 6 o'clock at night. We are locked in the church. Please let us out. We are locked in the church. Please let us out. I looked back and said, I have to shoot this scene. Stay up there, and once I get this scene done, I will talk to the pastor to unlock the doors of the church and get you out. Well, I said the lines, and we finally got those kids out of the church. But I have thought about that so many times since then. It seems to me that many Seventh-day Adventists today are locked in the church. They come to church every Sabbath. They listen to powerful sermons by Adventist preachers, but the doors of the church are locked. They come week after week and listen, but they have little impact on the community. They have little impact on the, their neighborhoods. In a sense, like the Jews of old, religion for them has become something in which they enjoy. They come to camp meetings like this, and they're served spiritual gluten, the pure stuff, from the pulpit every meeting. And they keep, those Adventists keep eating that gluten, eating that gluten, and they get spiritually fat. They fall over and die of a heart attack. You probably heard the story not long ago in one of our Adventist churches. Somebody died in the third row from the back of a heart attack, and the paramedics came to try to revive them, and when they came, they had to carry out seven people before they found which one was the dead one. <laughs> the doors of the church today, that was just a story that I made up. <laughs> but it probably is pretty close to true. 
the doors of the church are locked unless you are actively involved in witness for Christ and using the gifts that God has given to you. If you're locked in the church, you soon will die spiritually. The Pharisees prayed much of the day. The Pharisees were great biblical debaters, and they studied the Bible. But they had no outlet for their faith. They weren't sharing their faith. And eventually they died spiritually. Tonight my topic is how God takes ordinary people and does spectacular things. I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to someone in Scripture who is not front and center, someone who is often behind the scenes, but someone who God used powerfully. We only see Andrew three times in Scripture. We see him once in John chapter 1. We see him once in John chapter 6. And we see him once in John chapter 12. We might call him Andrew the Ordinary. But Andrew's story teaches us three things. It teaches us first that God uses ordinary people. It teaches us second that God uses ordinary methods. And it teaches us third that God uses ordinary moments. Now Andrew was very, very ordinary. He didn't write one book of the Bible. He didn't write a book of the Bible like Matthew or Mark or Luke in John. He wasn't a prolific writer like Paul. Didn't write a book of the Bible like Peter. Didn't write a book of the Bible like James. He was Andrew the ordinary. There is no miracle recorded that Andrew ever worked in Scripture, never worked a miracle. He did not heal the sick. He didn't touch uh, blind eyes and they were opened. He didn't touch deaf ears and they were unstopped. He didn't touch the withered man's arm and it was healed. He was Andrew the ordinary, didn't heal the sick. He didn't raise anybody from the dead. He was quite ordinary. He was not part of the inner circle, didn't go up on Mount Transfiguration when Jesus brought uh, Peter, James, and John. He didn't go on any missionary journeys like Paul. In fact, you do not have any record that he was a church leader. There's not one record in the New Testament that Andrew ever preached one sermon. There's not any record that he ever raised up one church. There's not any record that this man ever held one evangelistic meeting. But one of the most influential people in the entire New Testament narrative is Andrew. We might call him Andrew the Ordinary. Take your Bible, please, and look at John chapter 1. And we look there at John chapter 1, verse 40 and onward. One of the two who heard him speak, John, and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, are you known as somebody's brother or somebody's sister? Oh, I know you. You are Helen's sister. Oh, I know you. You are James's brother. Somebody talks to your husband, and you are standing there, and they greet your husband and talk for about 20 minutes, and you wonder whether you're invisible or not. Somebody meets your wife, oh, and they're all bubbly, they know her, and you got to stand there. You're known as somebody's husband, somebody's wife. People don't even know that you have a name. You are always somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's husband, somebody's wife. You're always kind of standing in the shadows. You know about Andrew. He was very ordinary and very common. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 40, and one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Every time you read about Andrew in the New Testament, he is bringing somebody to Jesus. This quiet, common, ordinary, nonchalant, no special talents, no special ability Andrew finds his brother Peter. He brings Peter to Jesus. And Peter accepts the Messiah and the fisherman becomes a mighty preacher. And Peter preaches and 3,000 are baptized on the day of Pentecost. And Peter with James becomes one of the leaders in the New Testament church. Peter writes that great epistle of Peter in the New Testament, Andrew had an influence far out of proportion of who he was and the talents he had. You may consider yourself very ordinary. You may consider yourself very common. 
But by the grace of God, you have a call to be a witness like Andrew. You can lead a brother, a sister, a father, a mother, a husband, a wife to Jesus. You can have an influence far out of proportion to who you are. Nobody ever may know you. But because of the person you lead to Christ, because of the mission that you do for Jesus, you can have an influence in the closing work. You may never have heard of Edward Kimball. Never at all. Edward Kimball was teaching Sunday school in Mount Vernon, Ohio. He was in his 70s, and he loved to teach the young adult class. And into that young adult class, a young man walked not too interested in spiritual things. And Dwight came into that class that day, and Edward Kimball had, oh, 12, 13 young men in the class, all in their early 20s. He noticed this young man, Dwight, sitting in the back of the class, kind of dazing off and kind of uh, just uh, very nonchalantly paying attention. He asked about Dwight after the class, and Edward Kimball learned that Dwight was not a committed Christian at all. He learned that he worked at a shoe store, and so that Monday morning, after the Sunday Bible class that Dwight had dropped into, Edward went to the shoe store and asked his manager if he could speak to him for a little while, learned that Dwight was down in the basement stocking shoes. And Edward Kimball went down, sat on the steps, and he said, young man, I noticed you in class the other day in the Bible class. Yeah, I went, but I'm not that interested in religious things. Well, young man, I'm interested in your soul. And unless you make a commitment to Jesus, you'll find that your life is fruitless and meaningless. And Edward Kimball presented the gospel to Dwight that day, and Dwight knelt there on the floor and accepted Christ, tears running down his face. And Dwight L. Moody became one of the most powerful preachers of his generation. He rocked two continents for God, but he did so because a Bible teacher in his late 70s, whose name you and I have rarely heard of, a common, ordinary man, an old man, took an interest in that young man, Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody was nothing very special, but he led thousands and thousands to Christ. You know, Dwight Moody never had real good English. He often made grammatical errors. Somebody says that's inexcusable. One day, Dwight Moody was preaching, and an English teacher came up to him, and she said, I took a little tally of the number of grammatical errors you made tonight, Mr. Moody, and you made 46 grammatical errors. And Moody looked at the English teacher and said, lady, I'm using all the English I know to win souls for Christ. What are you doing with the English you know? <laughs> Guy came up to Dwight Moody once, and he's a PhD in theology. And he said to Dwight Moody, Mr. Moody, I don't approve of your methods. And Moody said, I'd rather use the imperfect methods that I have and win somebody for Christ than use the perfect methods you have and win nobody, brother. God calls common, ordinary people. I love the way Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, please take it. You may be very common. You may be very ordinary. But God has a task for you. God has something for you to do. Because you see, if God uses the qualified, then they get the glory. God does not call those who are qualified. He qualifies those whom he calls. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those he calls. God does not call necessarily people that have all the gifts. He gives the gifts to the ones whom he calls. God reaches out and calls you to some task in sharing your faith for him. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. It doesn't say none. It says not many. God sometimes calls very intelligent people, very mighty, powerful people, very noble people. But it says not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 
But God has chosen, verse 27, the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things that are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. God calls those of us who are weak and those of us that don't have much wisdom. And God calls common people and ordinary people because Christ becomes our wisdom and Christ becomes our righteousness and Christ becomes our strength. And so Jesus uses common, ordinary people. I find it all over the world as I travel. Someplace tonight in inner Mongolia, there is a simple peasant woman. This woman began to study the Bible with people in her home, and the little group grew. It grew from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20. It grew from 20 to 30. It grew from 30 to 40. It grew to 60. The authorities in her community became so concerned that they came to her home, and they said to her, if you continue this Bible study group, we're going to put you and everybody in the Bible study in prison. It, they so intimidated the people in that Bible study group that 40 people left immediately, but the woman kept teaching and there were 20 left. They took her to the police station one day and they said, you have defied our order. We're going to put you in prison. One year prison sentence for a Bible study group that you're conducting in your home. She was put in prison. She began to, in prison, sing praises to Jesus. She began to share her faith with other women in that very harsh women's prison. At the end of six months, they said to her, we are shortening your sentence. She said, you cannot do that. <laughs> the law says that I must be in prison for a year, and I've only served six months. They said, look, lady, if we keep you in prison any longer, everybody in this prison is going to become a Christian. We are sending you home. They sent her home after six months because the woman was converting the whole prison. God takes common, ordinary people some place today in an unnamed city in southern China. There's a simple, godly woman. We know the city she lives in. It may put her in danger for me to mention it, and I will not do that. About seven years ago, this woman decided that God was calling her to do something in her home. She was a housewife. She had no theology training. But as she read the Bible, she was convicted that the Spirit of God was leading her, common, ordinary, to do something in her home. She began inviting people in. They began coming. She studied the Bible with them for six months or nine months. And many said, now the Lord wants us to be baptized. No pastors in the area at all. What should she do? She prayed about it. She said, Lord, what can I do? She knew a carpenter, and she called him in. And she said, look, the only thing I can think of is I have a wooden floor in my home, and beneath that there's dirt. Why don't we take a saw, and we'll cut out a place about four feet wide, about eight feet long, in the kitchen. We'll make a trap door. We'll put it under the carpet. We'll conceal it. And we'll dig a baptistry and we'll pour cement and I'll make a baptistry in my kitchen, which they did. She didn't know what to do. There were no preachers around, nothing she could do. And so she thought, maybe I'll just baptize some of these people. So she did baptize them. In the last seven years, 500 people have been baptized in that woman's kitchen. What is happening is absolutely amazing. The Spirit of God came down on a common, simple woman in China. It is happening around the world tonight. Lay people are hearing the call of God to give out literature, to become part of a small group. They're hearing the call of God to give Bible studies. Common, ordinary lay people. We look at the life of Andrew. No spectacular skills. No book, he didn't write any books of the Bible, performed no miracles, but God used him in a very powerful way because God uses ordinary people, people that will give him the glory, people that will give him 
the praise for what's happening in their lives. Lay people who are recognized that God is calling them to do more than simply occupy a place in the pew. But God gives them a mission or a, a ministry. A ministry in the office that they work in. A ministry in the hospital that they work in. A ministry in the neighborhood that they have. Pierre Barton is an atheist. He wrote a book called The Comfortable Pew. And this is what Barton said. Barton said, I'm an atheist, but I really believe in the church because the church is the best place to go on Sunday morning when you've gotten drunk on Saturday night and it's the best place to sleep through your hangover. And he said, the church is a place really that has no power at all and it's a place where the comfortable to go to get comforted by easygoing, crossless, accommodating sermons that simply lull them to sleep in their complacency. I believe that Pierre Barton is absolutely wrong. That the church of Christ in this world is a dynamic, powerful agency that God has raised up that is full of life to finish his work. In every place I go in the world, Seventh-day Adventists are discovering that they are part of the priesthood of believers, that they discover that they, when they become Christians and Seventh-day Adventists, they accept Christ, that Jesus puts a sparkle in their eye, a smile on their face, a song in their heart, and he leads them out to mission. God is using today common, ordinary people. The second thing we learn about Andrew is this. Not only does God use common, ordinary people, but he uses common and ordinary methods. Take your Bible, please, and turn to John chapter 6. Today, we have satellite evangelism and web evangelism and internet evangelism. We have computers and databases. We have radio and television. We have CDs and tapes and videos and DVDs. We have the printed page and we have literature. And we have millions and millions of pages they come off the presses. But God's best method is still some person telling some person about Jesus. God is still in the business of using very, very simple methods. Take your Bible, please, and turn to John chapter 6. God uses very ordinary people. And God uses very, very ordinary methods. John chapter 6. You know the story in John chapter 6 very, very well. Jesus sits upon the mount by the Sea of Galilee. And 5,000 people gather, and they listen to Jesus preach all day. And there are peasants in that crowd. There are merchants in that crowd. There are artisans in that crowd. There are intellectuals in that crowd. There are teachers in the crowd. There are scribes in the crowd and Pharisees in the crowd. There are Sadducees in the crowd. The young and the old are in the crowd. The rich and the poor are in the crowd. There are single mothers in the crowd. There are couples in that crowd. And there are young children in the crowd. And as Jesus preaches all day, many of the young children get hungry. Many of the teenagers get hungry. And, and the disciples are concerned about the crowd. And they say to Jesus, you better dismiss them and let them go and get something to eat. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And Peter, Philip speaks up and he says, six months of wages isn't enough to feed these people. And then Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Here we have it again. John chapter 6, verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, there he is again, the one who always lives in the shadow of his brother. I suppose when they were younger, Peter could run faster. Suppose when they were younger, that Peter could swim farther. So suppose that when they were younger, Peter was the outspoken one. Andrew, the ordinary. Andrew, the common one. Andrew, who had this eye for people. Andrew, the ordinary, who led Peter to Jesus. Andrew, who had an influence far out of proportion to his own abilities and gifts. Andrew sees a young boy. Andrew, John 6 and verse 9, Andrew said to, G to him, there is a little boy here. He has five loaves and two fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus says, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish. And they had as much as they wanted. And when they were filled, he said to them, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Andrew says, we don't have much. 
It's just common, ordinary loaves and fishes. And Jesus said, that's enough. Give it to me. Jesus took something very simple, loaves and fishes. You couldn't get any diet more simple than that in the New Testament period of time. And Jesus took the loaves and fishes and he multiplied them because little in the hands of Jesus is much. And small in the hands of Jesus is great. And Jesus takes ordinary people and Jesus takes common methods and Jesus multiplies them. What do you have? You say, I don't have much, Lord. Moses said to the Lord, I don't have much. What do you have in your hand, Moses? I don't have much. It's just this stick. It's this dirty old filthy stick. It's this common stick. I don't have much, Lord. It's just this stick. It's this stick that I had and I chased away the bear. It's the stick that I had and I fought off the lion. And Jesus says, Moses, what do you have in your hand? A rod in God are enough. Moses, I'll take that stick and I'll use it to deliver Israel. What do you have, Andrew? I just have five loaves and two fishes. That's enough because little in the hands of Jesus is much. Small in the hands of Jesus is great. What do you have? What do you have? What talents do you have? What abilities do you have? Give them to Jesus. I believe that Christ can take the men and women here at Michigan Camp Meeting and as we present our loaves and fishes to Jesus, as we take our common ordinary abilities and we present them to Jesus, as we take common simple methods with consecrated hearts and consecrated voices and sanctified tongues, we can move Michigan for Christ. We can move every village, every neighborhood, every city, every valley. We can move every town in this conference for Jesus Christ taking what we have and giving it to Jesus. You say, I am too old. Judging from some of you, you are past 60 years old. I would be very interested. How many in this audience tonight are retirement age or you have, or you have already retired? Can I see your hands? Well, that's at least half this audience. I believe that old people are going to finish the work. You know what my biblical evidence is? I'm coming to the young people. Hang on there. I'm coming to you. I have a question for you. How old was Moses when he led the children of Israel out of Egypt? Are you 80 yet? Some of you are. I'm coming to you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Moses' greatest work was done when he was after 80. Correct? How old was Daniel when he had his first vision? Now, he was 17 in chapter 1 when he was in captivity. Three years later, he graduated from the University of Babylon. He was 20, 21, and he interpreted the king's dream. What chapter in the book of Daniel gives you Daniel's first primary vision? Daniel chapter 7. What year is that? First year of Belshazzar. How old is Daniel? He's probably in his 70s anyway. Probably in his 70s, maybe in his early 80s, and he has his first vision. You may be in your 70s, and the visions you have of what God wants you to do are the greatest. How old was John the Revelator when he wrote the book of Revelation? 90. If Moses is 80, and Daniel is in his late 70s. Now listen to me, brother, tonight. You're retired. You thought you were going to sit in the rocking chair. If Moses is in his 80s, if Daniel is in his late 70s, early 80s, if John is in the book of Revelation, he writes it when he's 90, God has a work for you to do in the latter years of your life that you have no comprehension of yet. You can be an influence on some young person for Jesus Christ that can move them. There is wisdom that comes from a seasoned mind that can make a dramatic difference in the closing work. And if you have yet retired or you're older, and you've said, leave it to the young people, God has a work for you to do yet that may thrill your soul. The last years of your life may be the most productive years of your life. Whoever you are tonight, listen to me. God may have a work for you that you can't imagine. You can influence some young preacher. 
You can influence some young person in your church. You can win some Apostle Paul for Jesus Christ. There is something noble for you to do, something great for you to do, something grand for you to do for God. That's the other end of the spectrum. Now let me move to the other end of the spectrum. I am amazed today what God is doing with young people. God is moving in young people. Have you heard about that elementary school in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Seventh-day Adventist Elementary School? The teacher of that school said to her young people, young people, how would you like to hold an evangelistic meeting? These kids in the fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade raised their hand, teacher will do it, teacher will do it. The kids were 11, 12, and 13 years old. They said, let's write on the board people that you think you can invite to the meeting. One little girl raised their hand, my sister, she's supposed to be an Adventist teacher, but she's out dancing on Friday night, I'll ask her to come. Oh, my father, he's a deacon, but you know, he smokes a little bit. You gotta be careful in your home when the kids hold the evangelistic meetings, they'll put you on the prayer list. They know what you're doing in that home. You can't fool those kids. You better get right with God, brother. You get, better get right with God, sister. Maybe secret in your home, but sometimes it's going to be public. So these kids write the names of their parents on the board, their sisters that don't know Jesus. They write, on the board, they wrote 18 names. Some of those kids began to do special music. Some of these kids were 11, 12, 13 years old. They got our sermons. The teacher taught them in the Bible class, what better thing is it, teachers, to do in your Bible class than let young people that are 11, 12, 13 practice preaching the Seventh-day Adventist message. They preach these kids in the Bible class. They learned about the Bible by preaching on the Adventist message to the other kids. They learned about the signs of the second coming of Christ, kids 11, 12 years old, by preaching on the second coming of Christ to their classmates. They didn't have some theoretical class in the Bible. They learned about the Sabbath, and they learned the text on the Sabbath when they had to preach it to their classmates. The day came for their evangelistic meetings. There were about 60, 70 people in the audience. 35 of them were not Seventh-day Adventists. Do you think that that little girl's father would have come to hear Pastor Mark Finley preach? He would not have come, but he came to hear his daughter preach. Do you think that 17-year-old girl out dancing on Friday night would have come to hear Pastor Mark Finley in some big auditorium? No, she would not have, but she came to hear her sister preach, and those parents came to hear their sons and their daughters preach. One little boy, 11 or 12, preached on the mark of the beast. And one man who happened to walk in off the street came up to the little kid. He was 12 years old after the sermon. And he came up to the little boy and he said, I am angry. I am so angry. And that little kid, 12 year old, his hand is shaking, his knees are knocking. The kid is sweating. And the man says, I'm angry. And this is why I'm angry. I am so angry because my church never taught me these things. And I had to hear it from a 12 year old. Where is your pastor? I need to learn more about what you have taught tonight. Those children in North America, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, baptized 14 people in their evangelistic meetings. ASI just had a major evangelistic series, and the ASI leadership went over to Nairobi, Kenya. One of the ASI vice presidents was going, and her grandfather became ill and ultimately was near death and died, and she had to cancel out in her series. So the ASI officers got over there, some of them brought their families, and. Uh, they uh, were really concerned because there was one site that there was nobody now to preach at since this one vice president couldn't go. And so two of the ASI officers were talking about it. Michelle Katarama from Hinsdale, Illinois, was talking about it with her husband. Uh, and uh, as they were talking about it, Vito and uh, Michelle, the little boy, Michael, 12 years old, a little boy I baptized in Hinsdale, uh, a couple of years ago when he was 10, but now he's 12 years old, and mom and dad are talking about it. They said, we just don't have anybody to preach at the site. The little boy raised his hand. Dad, I'll preach. Now, if you'd see that little boy on the campground, I mean, he's not some child preacher walking around with black pants and a white shirt and a black suit and a black bow tie with his Bible under his arm. I mean, he's just a kid like any other normal kid. I mean, he's running all over the place, you know, and he's a 12-year-old boy. He says, Mom, I'll preach. What do you mean? You never preached a sermon in your life. Mom, if you can read those sermons and preach, I can read those sermons and preach. And Dad can push the button on the DVD for me. I'll preach. Well, they came to the site. Now, the African leadership, you need to understand the African mentality. The grayer your hair in Africa, the more you respect it. If those of you are here from an African vintage, you understand what I mean. In Africa, you respect old age. Well, this little kid, 12 years old, came to preach. And so the elders gathered around his father. And they said, 
we are not quite sure about this. Can you get us somebody else? And the dad wisely said, this boy's all you got. Either he preaches or nobody preaches. The elder said, okay, let's let him preach. A thousand people came out that night. And by the second week, 2,000 were coming out to hear the boy preacher. And by the third week, 3,000 were coming out to hear the boy preacher. Twelve years old, he had 5,000 coming out. I'll tell you, many an evangelistic crusade, I wish I had 5,000. And the little boy preached, and he made an appeal, and they baptized 400 and some odd people. Second highest of all the ASI officers. God is using, I believe today, that God is going to use young people to finish the work. And old people, and middle-aged people, and gray-haired people, and no-haired people. <laughs> and literate people, and illiterate people. There's no place in the Bible that tells me that any age is going to finish the work. God's going to use everybody that has a voice. The Spirit of God is coming down today. And God is using ordinary people. And God's using ordinary methods. If he could take the loaves and fishes and bless it, he can take what you're doing and bless it. Has God called you to prayer ministry? Has God called you to prayer ministry? To pray for your city? When I was teaching in Chicago at the Soul Winning Institute, I used to take my students to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and walked through that Billy Graham museum at Wheaton College, and there's a little room that's dedicated to a woman called Ruth Gouge. Ruth Gouge was a simple, slender, African-American maid. And for 20 years, with nobody knowing it, she would check into hotels and gather a few women around her to pray for a young preacher by the name of Billy Graham. A young preacher from the South, but the gospel bridges all ethnic barriers and she heard Billy Graham preach and believed he was anointed by God. And she made it her ministry to pray for him for 20 years and gathered women's prayer groups to pray for him. Blessed is the pastor that has prayer warriors in his church praying for him when he gives Bible studies. Blessed is the pastor that has prayer warriors praying for him when he's out holding an evangelistic meeting. I don't know what God is calling you to do tonight, but he might be calling you to use a simple method like the loaves and the fishes that he's going to multiply. You may be a young mother, and it may be difficult to get out of your house because you've got young kids. God may be calling you tonight to gather prayer groups in your home to pray for your cities, to pray for your church, to pray for your neighborhood, to pray for your pastor. That simple, common, ordinary method. Like the loaves and the fishes, God uses what you do. He doesn't use what you don't do. If Andrew would not have found the little boy, and if the loaves and fishes would have stayed in the boy's basket, the story would not be in the Bible today. God cannot bless any literature you don't give out. God can't bless any Bible studies you do not give. God can't bless any prayers you don't offer. But when we take our common loaves and fishes and gives them to Jesus, he blesses them far beyond what we can imagine and far beyond our comprehension. I was down in Brazil, and when I was there, the conference president said to me, I was on one of these whirlwind tours, preaching in city after city after city in packed auditoriums, and the conference president said to me, Mark, you have to meet Ramon. You just have to meet Ramon. You will understand why when you meet him. He's one of our best soul winners here in our conference. He personally has led 1,200 people to Christ. So I went to meet Ramon. When I met him, I had to kneel down to get to his level. Ramon is a midget. He comes up to about my waist. And I was getting a stiff neck looking down at him. This man, probably in his 40s, has won 1,200 people to Christ. I will teach you Ramon's method. It is very, very simple. First thing you have to do is smile. Now let's practice. You're doing good. Second thing you have to do is do like this. Do like this. You're a little nervous. Michigan's a little conservative, I know. Okay, like this. I'm gonna teach you how to be a soul winner. You first what, smile? Then you do this, right? Okay, then you do this. Okay, now let's practice. We first smile. Then we do this. Then we do this. I said, Ramon, what are you talking about? You smile. Then you do this, and then you do this, and you win 1,200 souls. He said, Mark, this is the action of the video when you put it in, and this is the action of the video when you push the machine to turn it on. 
He said, I did not preach one sermon. The reason the conference president wanted you to meet me is because I use your videos. <laughs> All I do is smile, invite seven people to my home, eight people, 10 people, 12 people, put the video in, push the button like this, you preach him, and then I just come up and make a little appeal and say, don't you want to do what Pastor Billy said and accept Jesus? And I went 1,200 people that way. Can you do this? Can you do this? God is not going to bless all those videos that you purchased gathering dust on your shelf still in the cellophane. You can watch 3ABN till the cows come home. And you are not going to win anybody for Christ unless you invite some people to your home. You can be sanctified saints getting ready for translation yourself. But God is calling you today, ordinary people, common people, to use simple methods. Pray for people. Invite them to your home. Get them to watch a video. Give them an audio tape. Invite them to take Bible studies. When I was a young preacher, I am so indebted to God, so indebted to God. God brought into my life people that profound me influ profoundly influenced my life. As a young preacher, I began to minister in New Haven, Connecticut at the uh, Bright Horizons Home for Handicapped People. I was the associate pastor of the Hartford, Connecticut Church, and there outside of New Haven, there was a uh, home for handicapped people. And there was a young woman there who at 17 years old got bulbar polio. She was paralyzed from her neck down, from bulbar polio. Couldn't button her own blouse, could not take the spoon and put food in her own mouth. She was the longest living survivor in an iron lung in the history of the United States, was the cover girl for the March of Dimes. And later in her life, she began to study the Bible and she became a Seventh-day Adventist. Her head was sticking out of the iron lung. The iron lung was a large cylinder that kept her chest pumping and breathing because the polio had paralyzed her diaphragm and her lung structure. Very many, many a Friday night, Tinny would go in and I, and we'd, Tinny would make her a meal and we'd go in and Tinny would feed her and I'd study the Bible with her. I noted often when I came in, she'd be lying on her back and there was a stand above her head and her Bible would be there and she'd read page after page and memorize it and turn the pages of the Bible with her tongue. One day I was in a room and she said to me, Pastor Mark, if you will go to the third drawer, she was meticulously organized, if you will go to the third drawer on the left and you will notice my Bible lessons and I've had a little trouble correcting them because I have so many Bible students, I am studying the Bible with 39 different people. I'm studying the Bible with my nurses. I'm studying the Bible with my doctors. I'm studying the Bible with other patients. And I'm a little overwhelmed. Could we spend tonight correcting the Bible lessons? Here, a woman paralyzed from her neck down heard the call of God to witness. And she could not get out of the iron lung. But she prayed that God would bring into her room people that she could share her faith with so she could do something for Christ and from an iron lung paralyzed, she was giving 39 different Bible studies. God uses common, ordinary people. God endows them with gifts. God is leading you to do something. It might be a prayer ministry. It might be a literature ministry. It might be a burden for youth ministry. It might be a Bible study ministry. It might be a tape ministry. It might be a ministry to the people around you. My wife is a master with tape ministry. She's a master with tape ministry. We've had one barber and three of her hairdressers baptized in the last 12 years. You cannot do a Finley's hair without getting ready to walk through the baptismal pool. I well remember the day she came home in Hinsdale, when we were living in Hinsdale, I was directing the Soul Winning Institute. Tinny came home and said, Mark, you need to go down and get a haircut. I said, darling, I had a haircut eight days ago. I don't need one. She said, whether you need one or not, the barber is a hot interest. And if you wait, he's going to cool off. You need to go down and get a haircut. And she said, now let me explain this to you. There are three barbers in the Hinsdale barbershop. There's the old guy on the left. You don't want him. There's the woman in the center. You don't want her. 
there's the young guy with longish hair on the left. You've got to get to him. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, I took our son, Mark, to get a haircut. And when I brought him in the barber shop, this is what happened. I heard the barber talking, and he said something like this. Somebody said to him, man, did you see the news today? It's rather scary. And the barber said to the guy, if you think the news is scary, you should read the book of Revelation. You won't be able to sleep all night. It is the scariest thing I ever read in my life. There's all kind of dragons. My wife said, he is hot. He's an interest. You go down there and get your hair cut and talk to the guy. So I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's what most husbands say to their wives. So I went there, got into the barbershop. The guy on the left, the old guy was done. He said, can I help you? I said, no, I'm waiting for that guy over there. Why are you waiting for him? You know him? No, I don't know him. But my wife says he's a good hair cutter. He cut my son's hair. The center lady said, can I help you? No, I'm waiting for the guy over there. So the guy over there came. I picked up the newspaper and began to read it, and I said, boy, the news is scary. He said, if you think the news is scary, you should read the book of Revelation. <laughs> true story, not an evangelist tale. I mean, I didn't mean that. I meant um, it's a true story. So I looked at the guy, and I said, you ever read the book of Revelation? He said, yeah, I read it. You ever read it? Yeah, I read it a few times. He said, you think it's scary? Well, it's only scary if you didn't read the last few chapters and you don't understand it. It's quite scary if you don't understand it. He said, you understand it? Well, I understand some of it. Can you teach it to me? I'll tell you what I'll do. So you don't jump quick. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make an agreement with you. I travel quite a bit. You come to my house once a month and cut my hair free. I'm an Adventist preacher. And I'll study the Bible with you, free. I wanted to get him to the house, and I knew I had to use some method. So he came, began to come to the house. Teeny said, look, my husband travels a lot. He'll study the Bible with you when he's home, but we're going to give you tapes. Gave him tapes. Within six months, that barber was baptized. Became a powerful witness for Christ. Teeny seen three of her hairdressers baptized because she gave him tapes. Two in Berrien Springs, incidentally, weren't Seventh-day Adventists. Two of them in Berrien Springs, baptized because she gave them tapes. God uses loaves and fishes. The more sophisticated you think you have to become to witness for Christ, and you think you've got to have 13 certificates for soul winning on the wall and you still don't win anybody, you don't need 13 certificates on the wall. If you love Jesus, you begin to pray, give out a piece of literature here, Give out a videotape here. Give out an audio tape here. Invite people to come to your home. Begin part of a Bible study program. You will be amazed. You give your loaves and fishes to Christ. I don't know what God is calling you to do, but I know tonight that every single person here, God is calling you to some form of witness. And if when you leave this camp meeting, you get on your knees and play fair with God, you be serious with God, and you say, now, God, I don't know what you want me to do. I'm common. I'm ordinary. I don't have any great abilities. But Lord, if you come down upon me, and if you touch me with your grace and power, and you give me direction of what you want me to do, whether it's prayer ministry or youth ministry or Bible study ministry, whatever it is, God, whatever it is, I want to do it. God uses common people, and God uses common methods, and God uses common moments, common moments. You will be at work. And somebody will tell you about the wife that just got cancer, a common moment, and God opens it up. You'll be at the grocery store, and you'll providentially see a friend you haven't seen for years. God uses common moments. You'll have a son that's drifting away, and the, he's dating some girl, and he's 18 years old, and he has little interest in faith, and he breaks up with his girlfriend, and he's up in his room crying, and you've built a relationship with him, and that's a common moment. You come up and sit on that bed, and you share with him about Jesus. John chapter 12, please. A very common moment. God uses common people. John 1, he used Andrew. God uses common methods. John chapter 6, he used loaves and fishes. John chapter 12, God uses common methods. Common moments. God uses common moments, ordinary moments. Jesus didn't plan his witnessing very much. It was very unstructured. But Jesus was so in tune with the Father that he took common moments and turned them into divine opportunities. Jesus walked down the street and he saw the woman at the well in Samaria. And it was a common moment on a common day and the sun was shining at noon and it was a common well. And Jesus blessed 
that moment, and it was a divine opportunity. Jesus came along, and he saw Zacchaeus up in the tree, and it was a common moment, and Jesus captured it. And Jesus saw Matthew at the tax collector's booth, and it was a common moment, and Jesus called him. And Jesus saw Peter drying the fisherman's nets, and it was a common moment, and Jesus called him. In John chapter 12, when you see Andrew again, Andrew has common talents, John 1. He uses common methods in John chapter 6, and he sees common moments, and he recognizes that they are moments of grace and moments that the Holy Spirit has worked and he doesn't want to miss those moments. John chapter 12, John chapter 12. And we look there at verse 20 and 21. Now there were certain Greek among those who came up to worship at the feast. The Greeks were there then, they were going to go home. And if you miss that moment and they leave, you've missed it. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Their hearts were stirred. They were open now. They weren't open six weeks before. They may not be open six weeks after, but they were open now. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man might be glorified. Andrew took those Greeks to Jesus then because they were open then. Ask God to help you to see people that are open. Ask him to help you to take advantage of those common moments because people are passing us every day and many of them are going into Christless graves. And God wants us to have our spiritual radar up to see these common moments. Not long ago, I came into a common moment. I was in one of the great countries of the world. I will not name that country because I want to protect the privacy of the political leader. I flew into that country, and as I flew there, I got off the plane, and my hosts said to me, Pastor Mark, we have arranged for you a meeting with the president of the Congress. And so they ushered me in to the Congress Hall, beautiful, lavish Congress Hall, and I met the president of the Congress, talked to him about Seventh-day Adventist work and church and what it was doing in that particular country. With him, there was a congressman, 33 years old, the youngest congressman in that country. He, this young congressman had an Adventist father, or rather an Adventist mother, and uh, was one of the moving political leaders in the nation. We had a great visit with the president of the Congress. We walked out of the presidential, the, the president of the Congress's chamber, and the uh, young congressman had a cell phone. And I noticed he dialed a number on the cell phone, was talking to somebody. He put the cell phone down, and he came over to me. He said, Pastor Mark, the president of our nation happens to be away in China. He has a visit in China. The vice president of this nation is in control of the nation right now. And we are having terrible problems in the nation. There is a strike among our nurses. In addition to that, there is a major conflict in the nation among the farmers. And the vice president of the nation who's in control, the Congress voted yesterday for the president to come back from China, but the vice president's doing such a marvelous job, they've said maybe we should let the vice president handle this crisis. The vice president has only slept about four hours a night. I just called him on his cell phone. He will see you at the White House if you can go right now. In this particular country, not the United States, but this particular country, I knew that that was a divine moment of grace. I was taken to the White House of that country, ushered in past the major security guards. Now, to get a, to get a appointment with a vice president of a nation of this stature and this prestigious, would, you'd never get it. And if you did, it would take you years of protocol. One cell phone call, and in five minutes I was there, taken by this armored car, came into the chamber where I was to meet the vice president. I learned everything I could from the congressman about the vice president. I learned he was a Jew, and I learned a little bit about him. Got into that chamber, and they brought him in. As the vice president came in, I noticed he did not have a tie on a little unshaven. He was haggard. He had been through conflict after conflict after conflict on the news in the newspaper, and he came in. And I knew I had very little time, and I said to him, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, the ancient Hebrew prophets were brought upon the scene by God to bring peace to the Hebrew kings. You're a political leader, and I've been reading the news. There's strikes among your nurses, strikes among your farmers, and I sense that in addition to being the Vice President, you're a human being. And you probably have a heavy heart, and your stomach is probably in knots, and you're probably torn apart by the conflict in your nation, and you wonder where to turn and what to do. Can I spend a little bit of time studying with you 
about the God that is still on the throne and the God that gives you peace. He said, Pastor, please do it. We turned to the book of Isaiah. We studied the ancient Hebrew prophets. We read Isaiah chapter 26. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. We talked about how God could give him peace in the conflict, that the God on the throne could get him through the crisis that he was facing. It was a divine moment of grace. I knew it. At the end of the time, he hugged me and hugged me and hugged me and he kept thanking me. And then he asked me to leave and I left and the congressman stayed in him and I didn't know what happened. I was a little nervous. The congressman came out and he said, Mark, you're not going to believe this. The vice president of our nation told me that the meeting you just had with him for the last 15 or 20 minutes was the most important meeting of his day. He just explained to me that this nation is going through tremendous conflict and that he was, his energy was sapped and the meeting you had with him was like an oasis. It was like a time of refuge for him. God is going to lead you to divine moments, not maybe with some vice president of some nation, but with your son, with your daughter, with a husband that doesn't know Christ, with a person that works with you across the machine. The year was 1271 AD. The father and grandfather of, of Marco Polo met with Kublai Khan. Kublai Khan at the time was the ruler of most of the East. He ruled China and India. He begged them to immediately, when they get back to Europe, to send Christian missionaries. 30 years went by. Nobody came. And Kublai Khan lost interest. What would have happened to India, a Hindu nation, and China today, an atheist nation, communist nation? if it would have been Christianized. But the dynamic influence of the church at that divine moment when God opened the door. Sometimes on my knees, I wonder how many people passed me today whose hearts were open for Jesus if I only would have shared his love, if I would have been sensitive to his spirit. I want to be so sensitive to Jesus, not where I'm obnoxious and cram spiritual gluten steaks down people's throat. I don't mean being a Bible thumper and taking your Bible and knocking people over the head and telling them they're lost if they don't accept Christ immediately. I don't mean that at all. But, oh God, help me to know that as a common, ordinary man, you can take all my feebleness and all my weakness, and all my frailties. And you can use this tongue. Help me, Lord, to be less sophisticated about it all, less intellectual about it all in that sense, less analytical is the word I'm looking for, less analytical. I want to be intellectual, but I don't want to be analytical so much. Help me, Lord, to give somebody a simple track. Help me, Lord, to invite them to my home to watch some videotapes. Help me to be simple enough to gather up a Bible study group. Lord, you just take these little loaves and fishes I have and multiply them. And my prayer is, Lord, help me to be sensitive to people all around me. Somebody needs a bowl of soup. Help me bring it. Somebody needs a loaf of bread. Somebody's in the hospital, a husband in the hospital, a wife needs a lawn mowed. Help me go do it, Lord. Somebody needs prayer. Help me be there, Lord. Somebody needs a Bible study. Help me be there, Lord. Lord, help me be your eyes to see their need. Help me be your heart to love them. Help me to be your ears to hear their cry. Oh, Lord, help me to be your presence in the world today. Do you sense as this camp meeting comes to an end that God has something special for you to do? Do you sense tonight that whether you're six or 60, whether you're 12 or 80, whether you're any age in between, that God has given you gifts, that there's somebody he wants you to share his love with, somebody he wants you to share his grace with, somebody that he wants you to reach out and touch for him. Would you play fair with God tonight? Would you play fair with God? Are you willing tonight to say to God, God, 
whatever it is you want me to do, I want to do it. I want to be your eyes to see their need. I want to be your ears to hear their cry of woe. I want to be your feet to go to their home. I want to be your hands to stretch out in ministries of love. Lord, I want to give out that piece of literature. Lord, I want to give out that tape for that audio or videotape. Lord, I want to give that Bible study. I want to pray for them. I want to be, be sensitive to those older people that are home and lonely, Lord. Maybe that's my ministry. I want to be sensitive to those younger people. I don't know what your ministry is, but I sense tonight that God would not have us go home the same kind of people that we came here that God is calling us to a commitment to ministry, a commitment to service. He's calling us to a commitment not to talk about soul winning, but to do something for Christ. So my question for you tonight is this, as you go home for this camp meeting, what are you going to do differently than when you came? Are you going to do something different for Jesus? Are you willing to say, Lord, I may not know what it is, but whatever you want me to do, impress me with your spirit and I want to do it. Is that a fair question tonight? Would you like to stand and say, Lord, I'm going to do it. Whatever you ask me to do, Lord, whatever you convict me about, Lord, Lord, I want to go home from this camp meeting, a different man, a different woman. I want to go home and be a witness for Jesus. I do not always know where to begin, Lord. I stumble, I fumble. But Lord, if you could take old dry fish and an old loaf of bread and multiply it to feed some people, you can take me. If you can take an old stick, Lord, and use it to deliver Israel, you can use me. If you can use Andrew the ordinary, you can use me. Lord, help me to be sensitive to common ordinary moments. When you make a commitment like this, and in your heart you mean it, you will be absolutely amazed what God's going to do through you. He is going to do wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things through you. Play fair with God. As we bow our heads to pray, you tell him in your own words, Jesus, Jesus, convict me by your spirit. What do you want me to do? that's different from what I've been doing. Lord, what ministry do you have for me? And if you already have some ministry, ask him how you can expand that ministry. Let's pray. Oh, my father, my father, hundreds of people are standing asking you to convict them of what they can do, to use their common, ordinary talents for you. Lord, we're serious about this. We don't stand superficially or flippantly. Father, the wonderful thing about your grace is you know us personally. You know us individually. And Lord, you're going to send us from this place to do something significant for you. Help us to reach out to that young man, that young woman, that lady we work with, that man who's a checker, at the grocery store, that hairdresser, that nurse that we work with, that physician, that attorney, that salesperson, that farmer, that mechanic, that teacher. Lord, give us eyes to see. Anoint us with the Holy Spirit so we know the moment. And help us to reach out and touch somebody for Jesus. And may Michigan be different, forever different, because of June 25th, at a camp meeting where the Spirit touches us and opens our eyes and the scales fall and you lead us to witness for you. We pray thee in Christ's name.